Mally Moore. And I'm a fucking professional. Well, debatable. <laughs> this is the Silver Linings Playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's bleakest endings. And what a bleak ending we have for you this week. Fucking Ma- yeah, man. Mally, I am so excited to talk about this movie. It's Yeah, you've been like fucking pumped all week. It's in my top five favorite of all time. I love this movie. Uh, but, okay. Uh, it is no exception to the criteria for our show. Um, we are not fucking around. No, we're not. Uh, this is, as Mally mentioned, that's, that's we're we're gonna fuck around a little bit. Let's be honest. <laughs> as Mally mentioned, this is the Silver Linings playlist. If you're new to the show, what we like to do here is watch movies that have uh, bad endings, sad endings, weird endings, endings that make you feel either uncomfortable or upset when it's all said and done, and we try to find the good in them. Um, we're not good. Not no. Horrible uh, at it, but we are professionals. We're just amateur N- well, professionals. Uh, <laughs> ah. um, so yeah, as you can tell, uh, today's episode is Reservoir Dogs uh, by Quentin Tarantino. Mally, when was the first time you saw this movie? Uh this was a blockbuster rental for me. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a name um, I haven't heard. So in quite some time. for our younger listeners, Blockbuster was a movie rental place, a uh, national chain huge everywhere Mm -hmm. and yeah doesn't exist anymore although i think there's there's still like i think the one final blockbuster is in like alaska no it's not in alaska it's in like uh because that one closed down recently i think it's like oregon oh fucking oregon man something like that it's somewhere Um, up in the north uh, yeah because i remember seeing pulp fiction was my first experience with tarantino as with really okay yeah um because I think my mom and brother rented it back in the day. Like, that's how I saw a lot of movies I was way too young to watch was my brother or my mother would rent them. And yeah. then I would watch them. Like, I saw From Dust Till Dawn when I was, like, nine. <laughs> um, Hey, another Tarantino thing, kind of. Yep. Um, But, yeah, Pulp Fiction was definitely a rental that my parents got. And I watched it with them. And I was like, I don't understand this movie. Yeah. Um, I was like, that guy died. Why is he in this scene that happened <laughs> later? I didn't understand non-linear storytelling. Yeah. Um, but yeah, after, like, I rewatched it after a few years when I was older. I was like, oh, this movie's fucking rad. Then I dove into, like, more Tarantino. And I think Reservoir Dogs was the second Tarantino film I saw. Right. And I was like, oh, shit. This movie's rad. Um, and I mean, you know, we both went to film school. Mm-hmm. Like, Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs were fucking everywhere. It's like, dude, mm-hmm. favorite movie? Bro, Reservoir Dogs. Shut the fuck up. Yep. Um, but <laughs> it is a fantastic movie. But I I don't know. Like, there's this stigma with this movie, like, that any time... Because we both work, in, you know, in the film industry. Mm-hmm. And, like, there's just any time Tarantino, especially, like, Pulp Fiction or Reservoir Dogs get brought up, I can't help but roll my eyes a little bit. Yeah, that's. I, I feel there's like such like a stigma with yeah. like film people and early Tarantino. It's insane. It's more Pulp Fiction, I think. But yeah, RD gets kind of lumped in with that as well. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. For those of you who listened to our "Call Me by Your Name" episode with a uh, special guest Mitch Pereira, um, you know he he direct wrote and directed the film "Kill the Cat." Well, co-wrote and directed the film "Kill the Cat" that I worked on with him and that was like you know we always kind of gave him shit like dude this is just reservoir dogs um <laughs> it, it is a whole like that kill the cat was a whole ass homage to reservoir dogs and it's awesome like the influence on that that this movie had on him was insane like i wish we could have gotten him on this episode to talk about it but we already have one person fanboying hard <laughs> on this movie so yeah anyway dustin what's your relationship with this movie uh, I think I'm kind of in the same boat as you. I think it was the second Tarantino movie I saw, with Pulp Fiction being the first. Um, and I think I saw him actually rather late. No, you actually know what? Dude, I take that you back. see everything really late. You're right. I take that back. I don't think I saw Reservoir Dogs. Didn't you just see Blade Runner like a few months ago? <laughs> You're right. Uh, Jesus. I don't think I saw Reservoir Dogs until the late aughts, now that I think about it. I think it the was late one- what? Like, I think I saw it around 2009, 2010 for the first Damn. time. Yeah, I take that back because I did. Damn. I saw Pulp Fiction when I was about 16 or 17. And uh, around that time, Kill Bill had just come out. And I saw that. And then I saw Inglorious Bastards in theaters. Uh, but I don't think I got up to Reservoir Dogs until later. 
In fact, I know I didn't because I saw it when I was uh, in this band and one of the members had the poster of it up on this wall and I had just never seen it and he told me to go home and watch it and I did and I fell in love with it. Uh, we'll talk about rankings, I'm sure, in this episode. But Oh my, that was going to be my next question. It's it's going to be up Rank there. Rank Tarantino, well, let's go. Let's, well, let's, let's, let's hold on to that. Let's not blow our wad right here in the intro, so... Oh, uh, don't be gross. <laughs> uh, let's talk about it, though. Reservoir Dogs. The year is 1992. Director, as we mentioned, obviously, is Quentin Tarantino. The film is a, starring so many stellar people. Harvey Keitel, Tim Roth, Michael Madsen, Tarantino himself, Steve Buscemi, Chris Penn, and Lawrence Tierney. Uh, the budget was $1.2 million. It managed to gross worldwide $2.8 million. Pretty successful for a uh, you know, little small indie film. Uh, and currently sits at a 91% certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk about when we get into the film uh, how that budget came to be. But, uh, Mally, is there anything else you want to talk about before we get into the trailer? Do you have uh, any kind of uh, complaints or reservations about the 91%? No. I mean, again, like, I I don't know. I feel like I'm almost, I think it's just from that, like, film school stigma. Mm-hmm. Where I'm just like, I don't want to say I'm bored of the movie, but it's just kind of like, I've heard so many different people fucking like reference it and cherish it and all that shit where I'm just like, okay, yeah, Reservoir Dogs, it's really good. Let's talk about something else for the love of fucking God. See, I'm like that with Paul. And here we are (laughs) talking about it on recording for probably an hour. I'm like that with Pulp Fiction. I, I, it's a fine movie. But I'm just so over it. I'm so over the conversations about it. Um, I don't know. I can rewatch Reservoir Dogs three times over before I rewatch Pulp Fiction. Um, yeah. Maybe it's just the genre, or maybe it's just like the uh, the like the the narrative how it's constructed. But yeah, Pulp Fiction wears on me very very fast. Um, but yeah, let's get into the trailer because I actually like this trailer and I want to talk about it. Yeah. Hear your names, Mr. White, Mr. Blonde, Mr. Pink. Why am I Mr. Pink? Who cares what your name is? Yeah, that's easy for you to say. You're Mr. White. You have a cool-sounding name. Let's go to work. Well, I don't know why I came here tonight. I got the feeling that something ain't right. What happens if the manager won't give you the diamonds? Cut off one of his fingers. The little one. I feel scared <laughs> because I'm falling off the chair. And I'm if they hadn't have done what I told them not to do, they'd still be alive. You're acting like a first year thief. I'm acting like a professional. Choice you've been doing 10 years. Taking out some stupid money. Ain't no choice at all. Bam. Bam, 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 bam. You're under arrest, sugar. <laughs> Harvey Keitel, Tim Roth, Chris Penn, Steve Buscemi, Lawrence Tierney, and Michael Madsen. They're the Reservoir Dogs. Hey, Joe, I'm gonna shoot this guy. This trailer is so 90s. It's 90s, but it but still I has... I fucking love it. It's still... I think, given how old it is, it's still kind of got that modern editing technique. And I love it. Like, I love the uh, the bam, bam, bam over the actual gunshots. I think that was clever. Uh, it's a little... Like, it's a little long. Mm-hmm. But, like, I mean, it, it gives... Like, it does a really good job of giving you the tone of the movie. Yeah. Agreed. Um... Yeah, I got nothing else to get uh, into on backstory unless you want to just jump right into the movie. Let's do this. Rock and roll. Um, So do you want to get the rankings out of the way now or you want to wait until we've discussed the movie? Oh, please, no. Go ahead, sir. Um, Let's start number one. Or do you want to start at the bottom? Let's start at the bottom and like okay. give, give some kind of uh, thea- theatricality to it. Um, okay. I would say only because... It was kind of a chore to get through, and I don't think I've even finished it completely. Is, oh uh, f- shit! For me, it's just gonna—it's gonna be Jackie Brown. 
uh, uh, um, um, you just do you disagree? I'm, um, are you having a stroke? What's what? What's happening? Uh, do you love that movie? Do. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. We can have differing opinions. It was the last Tarantino movie. My, I've seen. my list is going to be very controversial. <laughs> okay, I, I, mine might be too. But yeah, I, I never finished Shanky Brown. It was kind of a little sluggish. Um, we're we're talking purely directing, right? I'm. T- I'm. I mean, or like, I would you count? You wouldn't count like, like True overall. Romance. Oh, that's what you're saying. Um, or like from Dust Till Dawn. Like you, we, we're just no, talking straight. Like, even though, like, I have this rad ass box set, mm-hmm. like that, like the Mondo box set. Um, yeah. it's everything he did up until right before. I think I think Django's included. No, wait, Django wasn't included in it. So it's everything through and glorious bastards. Mm-hmm. And they included True Romance. Okay, which I thought was interesting. Well, I mean, he helped write um, it, but. but- yeah. He, I mean, he wrote the original script, but then Tony Scott rewrote the fuck out of it. Yeah. And he wrote From Dusk Till Dawn based off a story from someone else. Yeah. But I don't know, like, I don't know if I would include either. Let's just go straight directing. I Good. wouldn't include yeah, that's, either of those. I don't consider, I consider True Romance to be a Tony Scott film and Natural Born Killers to be a novel or a stone film. So, like, oh, I don't want to. I do love Natural Born Killers. I don't want to count lie. those in here. Um, Bat shit crazy, but I love it. For me, yeah, Jack, I put Jackie Brown at the bottom. Maybe, and like I said, maybe it's just because I haven't finished it, but I found okay. myself kind of bored with it. Keep going. Well, uh, what's, what's your bottom one? Well, let's work our way up. No, 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 no. Come on now. Okay. Um, let's just let's keep it separated. Got to keep it separated. But see, that's where it's like a huge contention. Uh, I think I might. Hmm. I'm debating on two. Um, you know, I'll just say it. There are I'm no gonna, wrong. Answers, I'm going to put Dustin. Death Proof as my next. Okay. Uh, Interesting. Probably Interesting. not that controversial. Many people's least favorite. I actually like the movie, and that's why I say it's kind of a point of contention because from here on out, it's all good movies. Um, okay. Well, mm, debatable. <laughs> next one for me is probably Hateful Eight. Okay. I just, it's a great movie, but there's so much you could cut out of it. Um, okay. Hmm. I should have probably Don't thought about this. I should have probably thought about this before, but um, probably next would be Kill Bill Volume Two. I agree with you. I'm not gonna lie. I don't like Kill Bill Volume Two. It's it's a fine movie, but one is just perfect. One um, is great. Two, mm. not for me. Next would be see this is it's hard because they're all good movies. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what? Next for me is Pulp Fiction. Okay. Um, okay. then it would be probably Django. Okay. Followed by Kill Bill One. Okay. And then the last two are rough for me. Cause I go back and forth, but this the obvious last two. Um, man, you know what? I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna say Glorious Bastards is my number two, and Reservoir Dogs is my number one. Okay, well, see, at least our top two are the same. Although I have them reversed. I like Inglorious Bastards more. I think I like it more than Reservoir Dogs. I, like, I appreciate love Reservoir Dogs, RD. but like Inglorious Bastards is just. I don't know. I think like everything Tarantino's known for, he just does right in that movie. Yeah. Well, let's let's um, uh, let's do your your bottom to top. Okay. Then. So we know the top uh, two, but I, I'm I'm gonna go from the top down because I okay. can't go from I I, I got to do it in reverse. <laughs> so I'm gonna go bastards. Okay. Reservoir Dogs. Okay. Yeah. Jackie that's... Brown. <laughs> ja- okay. Wow. You really like Jackie Brown. Okay. I do. Okay. Um. All right. Again, mine's gonna be a little controversial. I mean, I put Pulp Fiction near the end, so I don't know how my... I mean... Death Proof. That's fine. I like Death Proof. Death Proof is a I fun movie. I love Death Proof. Um, I will say it's probably Pulp. controversial to put it above Pulp Fiction, but... Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Kill Bill Volume 1. Okay. Um. Wow, you like Death Proof more than Kill Bill Volume 1. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay, keep going. Yeah. 
Um, where am I at right now? <laughs> uh, you got Django left. You got Volume Two for oh, Kill Bill. Django, Volume Two, Hateful Eight. Damn. Okay, so you, I did you, not like Hateful Eight. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> just didn't do it man, for me. And you don't like Django that much. I did. I loved it when I first watched it, but every time, like I've rewatched it, I'm just like, eh. I, okay. Fair enough. I mean, I'm sure people are gonna hate us for not putting Pulp Fiction number one, but whatever. Um, Fuck you, film students. <laughs> I feel like I'm gonna get a. I'm gonna get so many texts and like messages on Instagram and shit. Like, uh, you're a fucking disgrace. <laughs> um, uh, this is a personal message to Mitch Pereira. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know, man. I feel like Pulp Fiction is. It's like the movies in the same caliber, like Citizen Kane, where of course they're great movies. But the rewatchability, the entertainment value is only so much. Like, there's only so much to mine there. I feel like RD has got much a much more rich, engaging atmosphere. The universe is more interesting. The the characters are all amazing. Um, the the story structure I feel like works better than it does in Pulp Fiction, which might be a point Dude, of contention. I I agree. Like. I mean, Knock Knock is just such a good movie. Like, all the characters are so rounded and not one-dimensional. Um, I, Oh, my God. Hmm. Imagine if Tarantino directed Knock Knock. <laughs> it'd be a much different movie, I'll tell you that. That's, yeah, it'd probably, it'd probably be almost as good as it already is. Um, I found myself... Every time I rewatch this movie, I love it, but I found myself really into this movie. Maybe it's because I haven't watched it in a while. But on this rewatch, I was I mean, same, dude. So like, Keanu's performance in Knock Knock <laughs> is just so encapsulated. But I forgot how easily this film opens. Like, it's very kind of quiet, but you instantly yeah. like, or at least I do, I instantly like all of these guys, and I think the conversation's great. Um, I mean, I don't like, like, I, Mr. Pink bothers me. Really? Because fuck him for not tipping. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I was going to ask, isn't he the worst? That's literally my like my, my first notes. Isn't he just the worst for not tipping? But God, I, just the it fits, fucking worst, bro. It fits so in line with his character that I'm like, yeah, makes sense that he would be the one to complain. And also so, there's it's the brilliance of setting up that Mr. Orange is a rat by him yeah, being the dude, one. Dude, there's so many hints and like foreshadowing of him being the rat it's yeah. insane like i never noticed it like that but he like, i feel like i feel like i catch some new hint every time i watch it yeah like when joe asked who didn't tip in he's the first one to say oh it's he's mr. immediately pink. just like oh it's mr pink yeah immediately yeah um but that, it's funny too because that tipping conversation sure seems relevant in today's society um but it's interesting because it's mostly irrelevant to the story the only thing you can really garn from that like that you can take out of that conversation is who these characters are and the fact that Mr. Orange is the rat. Like for the most part, yeah. I think that's what Tarantino does great in his dialogue is he'll have these seemingly meaningless conversations, but it tells you so much about, yeah, like that conversation does not seem important or relevant until after you finish the movie. You're like, Oh shit. Like it's, it's solely there to like introduce you to these characters, introduce you to the tone and you instantly identify with you know you understand who these characters are and you see how things were all fine once upon a time before everything turned to shit once upon a time in, in hollywood. hollywood yes <laughs> dude honestly from what i've what i've read in the casting of that movie i think that could make that could get towards the top of the list we'll we'll, we'll, we'll have to reconvene and talk about it rad. Yeah, yeah um i had a a buddy of mine anyway. Well, just just to just say something else about oh, that. Sorry. I had a buddy of mine whose uh, whose girlfriend was at uh, on Hollywood Boulevard uh, like two weeks ago, and Tarantino was filming down there with Leo and Brad Pitt, and uh, got a video that was pretty interesting of uh, uh, Leo driving and the uh, the rig that's on the car. You can see Tarantino like looking at his monitor. Leo can drive. Yeah, like they just rigged Whoa. they rigged the car up so like Robert Richardson could sit in front of it and have. Uh, like the the key light right there on it. It was just interesting to see Richardson and Tarantino next to each other on a rig where Leo and Brad Pitt are in the car driving, and there's just <laughs> an, uh, so many people on the block just watching and recording. But yeah, um, I'm excited about that movie, man. 
Yeah, it's gonna be. Uh, I don't know. I think it's. I think it's gonna be good fun. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I love old Hollywood shit. So yeah. Oh, actually, funny side note about Robert Richardson. My roommate actually bumped into him. Yeah. At a rental house, mm-hmm. and like he, you know, she just you know was walking down the hallway. And there he is, you know, holding, just walking down the hallway, you know, mm-hmm. with a cup of coffee and a bagel. <laughs> and she was like, he eats bagels. <laughs> he's just like, like us. <laughs> he's, he's just like us. <laughs> Only he looks like a like if Santa Claus did meth. He's one of my top five favorite DPs, for sure. Oh, he's good. He's good. Um, I love it. him and Tarantino just clash so well together. Um, but yeah, I I was just thinking Did about you say it. They clash so well together. Yeah, like they merge, like their styles, like complement each other very well. Okay. Um, yeah, it was just interesting this tipping conversation because it was like, I would think they would mostly all be kind of conservative, but it's interesting that like Steve Buscemi's character is like the only one that's called out for it, like the the not tipping. Like the typical kind of Republican kind of viewpoint on things, but then they're all fucking thieves and murderers, and just like scum and villainy. Uh, it's just really separates Mister Pink from the rest of them, and then Mister Blonde ends up being the craziest out of all of them. True. Um. So yeah, which which dog do you most identify with, Mally? <laughs> uh, not fucking Mister Pink. Yeah. Um, Should we rank the dogs? Like, who's the worst and who's the best? <laughs> is it bad that I kind of identify with Mr. Blonde? Because he's a psycho? See, I, yeah. I identify with probably Mr. White, but only because we don't really get to know Mr. Blue or Mr. Brown. And That's true. You really don't get to know. Like, I feel like you really only get to know pink, blonde, white, and orange. But I like that because it's like, oh, there's these other characters that we only get glimpses of. Like, it makes you more interested to like to find out about those things i'm kind of glad that we don't get to find out everyone's story like mr uh which one is mr blue tarantino or mr brown i always get those two confused he's mr brown that's right that's right and mr blue only like originally in the script he had no lines and then tarantino gave him some during the the uh the tipping scene conversation just so he could talk mm-hmm. yeah i like that you never find out what happens when they say you got shot right by the police yeah yeah okay uh, but yeah, I I think Mr. White is the most level-headed. Surprisingly, if you don't, because I, I don't count Mr. Orange as a dog, like because he he's really a cop. Doesn't I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um. What do you uh What do you think about Stephen Wright as the uh, K. Billy's sounds of the seventies? I I think his his voice alone is he's just as much a character in the movie as like, and you never see him. Oh yeah, I guess that yeah, that's true actually. I I think he's an amazing stand-up first of all, but also that iconic voice is uh, he's there to transition between acts and I just it's so clever to do that too and like to change up the soundtrack in between the different beats of the story. Stuck it's stuck in the middle with you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So we're we're in agreement though that this film does the non-linear storytelling better than Pulp Fiction, right? Yeah. Like as I like that uh when we first, you know, we get through the opening credits and we're there with Mr. Orange in the back seat being having been shot. I like that um that scene comes around near the end once you know the full story and you know that he's a cop and you get to see him shoot the woman, the woman who apparently had a baby and like you get to understand how clearly fucked he is, like how wrong the situation's gone. Not only is he been shot in the gut but he's he's killed a civilian all while on under the guise of being undercover and you really like we get a new angle from that scene too we don't even see mr white when we come back to that that scene later on in the movie and i think it's just Mm -hmm. brilliant how they how they set all that up because it gives him credit like as mr white says it gives him credibility up front like there's no way he could be the cop he got shot he took a bullet for him he shot a woman like it's it's so brilliant this script is just a fucking like i always forget about tarantino's other first movie my best friend's birthday or whatever it is i've never seen it me neither i could like it's kind of might be kind of like wrong to say i consider this his directorial debut but he directed that other movie which i've never seen yeah i mean i think most people consider it 
consider it maybe because i don't think that one's ever really gotten kind of the release that this other stuff has but has besides like the obvious ones like get out or a quiet place has there been a directorial debut that's been as strong as this because this is insane Uh, how well citizen kane yeah that's a good point it's insane how well tapped this script is how well tarantino come come like these are powerhouses quick side note yeah have you noticed that people keep referring to A Quiet Place as John Krasinski's directorial debut? What's well, his feature directorial debut, isn't it? No. Uh, what else did he? Do? Oh wait, no. What else did he do? Um, I can't remember the name of any of them to be honest. But he's <laughs> done like two or th- two or three movies before that as as director as like feature films. Yeah, hang on. Okay. Brief interviews with hideous men and the Hollers. Never heard of either of them. Copy Maybe that. like the first one to get like kind of mainstream, uh, like notoriety. Maybe I don't know. Um, I guess interviews with brief interviews with hideous men is actually pretty entertaining. Like, oh, you saw it? It's, it's not. Re- yeah, I saw it. it. Was on Netflix for the longest time. Hmm. Um, but anyway, how much? Um, of wait, what about Get Out? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's I, I mentioned Get Out. Get Out, Sister Kane. Did you? Like, was that one of the situations where I wasn't listening again? But probably. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like yeah. when I talk, you mostly just tune out. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I have a question for you then to be more interactive. Um, how much of Tarantino's films do you think it equates to him, person, like his personality and like his directing style? Or do you equate to like his editor and his music supervisor? Because they always seem to knock it out of the park. Like the music's always great, the editing's always great. Like I know Tarantino is obviously obviously his director, so he's gonna like, you know, the right. final say I mean, on things. He's, but uh, what's her name? Sally Ming Ming. I think Sally Mimke was her name. Yeah. Yeah. Who I mean, recently this was passed. her first movie. She did this plus the next five Tarantino films. So and I mean, they're all fucking. They obviously stellar. have a great relationship. Uh, yeah, Sally Mimke, who uh, passed away in 2010. Um, and then his music supervisor, uh, I gotta find her name because she's amazing too. Um, where's where's that? Keep keep talking while I look it up. Okay, talking. This is what I'm talking. Karen Karen Rackman. Karen Rackman, who was uh music supervisor on Boogie Nights. Uh, this film. I'm just looking through her uh, IMDb. <laughs> music supervisor on Holes. <laughs> um. Yeah, man. Like, I, I read that they spent the entirety of their music budget on Stuck in the Middle with You because Tarantino was so, uh, like, determined to have that song in there. And then they just worked out deals with all the other ones where they would make their money back on the soundtrack when they sold it rather than being, you know, paying up front for the, the rights to yeah. the song. And there's no, like, musical score in this movie. It's all, like, recorded tracks, too. Which is smart. Like, it... Which it, is... It works. Yeah. It works so well. Um... Yeah, it's just it's just impressive that this early on in a filmmaker's career that they like establish exactly what their style is, and they very very rarely divert from it and only really build on it because all the Tarantino's work stems from this movie, like his style and his well, and it's dialogue. crazy that like his style he adapts so well for like period films like Inglorious Bastards or Django or Hateful Eight. Yeah. But still or managing even, to put his his own spin on it, or even in like kind of different like genres, like with Kill Bill, like yeah, it it's weird how well his style just like he can acclimate it to different things. I guess that's what happens when you're a, a literal film encyclopedia, like you know everything. <laughs> um, what do you think about the uh, the ill fated Vega Brothers movie? Honestly, God, if they Travolta. had gotten them in their prime, I would have been so fucking in right, for that. Right, right. I kind of like uh, that. Was it Double V Vega? Double V Vega. That would have been fucking amazing. Kind of a dumb name, but yeah, would have been a great... Nah, it, it's a dumb name, except that it's Quentin Tarantino and he could get away with it. So it's Vic Vega. Like His, his movies have silly titles. Reservoir Dogs. Like when you relate them to the actual movie, like Pulp Fiction... Like Jackie Brown makes sense, Kill Bill makes sense, um, Death Proof, 
and Glorious Bastards kind of makes sense. Well, Reservoir Django Dogs only came like, along because he misheard a title of a French movie. As, uh, wait, is that true? Yeah, like he was in when he was. What was the the? I can never remember the name of it. The movie store he worked in that was kind of like blockbuster before its time, and that's Family Video. Was it that? No, I don't know. That was no. just another big chain. Um, no, I don't think that was it. But anyways, somebody came Quick in. Quick stop. No, nope, that's Clerks. <laughs> someone came in to recommend a movie, and I can't remember the name of the movie is, but it was Reservoir Day something or something like that, and he heard it as Reservoir Dogs and thought that's a cool name and. Picked it. Well, at least that's how the legend goes. Anyway, I don't know if it's been confirmed. Dun 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 dun. Um, Legends of Tarantino. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the complexity of these characters is just—it's so good because, like, the empathy for Mister White is astounding for Mister Orange, giving his personality. And I mean, he's a villain that I adore. And all of these characters, other than essentially Mister Orange, are just the worst people. But I don't know, man. Like, whenever he's... I wouldn't even say Mr. Orange is the best person. No, no. When Mr. White is, like, t- like arguing with Mr. Pink about how they got to take him to a hospital, that he couldn't be the red because he saw him take a bullet for him. Like, Mr. White seems to be the most level-headed, but at the same time, he's still, he still shot two cops in the fucking face. True. It's... it's Weird how Tarantino gets is able to do that with uh Harvey Keitel's so good in this movie. And like we have we have him to thank for this movie because of his involvement. Yeah, that's true. Like uh his wife had gotten a copy of the script and Harvey read it and loved it so much that he threw in some of his own money to get the budget up higher. And of course that led him to be in pulp fiction and everything. And this movie is just I couldn't imagine it without Harvey Keitel. He Mr. White is one of my favorite characters of all time. Mallory, are you a fucking professional? Nope. Okay. That answers my question. Well, you know, you've been doing a lot of complaining this episode. I, oh, and, oh uh, mm, all right. Well, I only got one question for you. Accusations. Are you going to bark all day, little doggy, or are you going to bite? <sighs> and by bite, I mean, are you going to take the bait to win some free Blu-rays? You're so from- proud of these little contest code bits that they're you do. never good you think they're never they good. are so funny no 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 i i know they're not clever i know they're fucking terrible uh but you gotta do something interesting right yes uh and yeah you can take the bait to try and win some free stuff from us uh just go right now if you don't mind to reddit.com slash r slash silver linings playlist find the official discussion thread should be stickied up there if you're listening to it the week it comes out for Reservoir Dogs. And in that thread, leave this code as a comment for a chance to win some free stuff from us. That contest code is, of course, previously mentioned. Are you going to bark all day, little doggy? And I don't care how you spell doggy. I.E. with a Y, whatever you want to do. But are you going to bark all day, little doggy? Leave that as a code, as a comment. We'll randomly select a winner, get in touch with you, and send you out some free stuff. It's that easy. Free stuff. That's it. True story. I got some Mr. Orange trivia here. I want to know if you knew Ooh, about let's this. Hear it. Um, I, well, I wanted to ask you first before we get into it. What do you think Mr. White whispers in Mr. Orange's ear? Uh, I don't know. Like, I don't really have anything that I believe. It's kind of like lost in translation to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, I don't actually know. Yeah. I mean, I've... I know there's a bunch of like theories and like there are are like translations from other like when the movie was shown in other countries but i don't know yeah um here's the trivia i got uh although there's no definitive answer uh because as harvey Cottel never said i think what happened here is it was kind of like an improvised thing that tarantino decided to keep in the film uh in the french release of the film the subtitles say uh you don't want a blowjob by the way do you as he's like combing his hair it's like just kind of a funny line in really in the italian dubbed version of the movie he says do you want me to give you a hand job too uh and in the spanish dubbed version he says i'll comb your hair so you look handsome but from what i can understand okay when i gather around the internet it seems like harvey Keitel just kind of whispered something into his ear it doesn't matter what it was but it was meant to be to make him kind of laugh Specific. Maybe it was Rosebud. Yeah. <laughs> he whispered something. I'm sure there's people out there who, like, crank the audio and try to, like, 
decipher what it is. But I'm sure Harvey Keitel probably doesn't even remember what he said in his ear. So we, we'll oh, probably I never know. Guarantee he doesn't. Um, but he sp- probably was like, "What's well, my line?" But yeah. But speaking of uh, audio things like here. Uh, I want to know if you noticed this. Stuck be- in the middle with you. Yeah, I wanted to know if you noticed this because I never did. And when I found out about this, I listened for it and I heard it and it blew me away. But uh, do you know about the uh, during that stuck in the middle scene with you? The oh no no yeah 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 because I didn't Tarantino know about that yelling in the background. So for people that don't know about that, uh, and if you have a copy of this movie, it might be on your copy. You can go back and listen to yourself. Um, during the torture scene, uh, Michael Madsen apparently had some difficulty mm-hmm. filming that because he's strongly opposed to like to violence on of that level. And uh, well, I think it was more so the mention of uh, yes, was, it has something to do with, like he had just become like he had just had a son. Yes, and the guy like the cop Kirk Nash Balks. or whatever yeah. improvised. The oh, I got a wife and kid. Yeah, he's got I got a Madsen kid at was home. Like, oh, fuck. so what happened was. Uh yeah, Michael Madsen was like, I don't want to like. It's it's amazing that he that he's Mr. Blonde, but he was the one the most opposed to the violence. Um, yeah, right. He had just become a father and was filming this torture scene. And yeah, the guy that plays Marvin Nash, Kirk Baltz, improvised a line on set uh, right before Mr. Uh, Blonde is about to light him on fire. It says, "Please, I've got a kid at home." And in the mix. Uh, of the movie you can hear tarantino behind the camera going oh no 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 <laughs> because he knew uh, he thought michael Madsen would break character and like it would mm-hmm. he, he didn't know where it was going to go but i had never noticed this and i noticed it on my copy uh, that i could hear it like it's it's kind of difficult to hear because kirk baltz is talking and michael Madsen are kind of talking over one another but you can clearly hear tarantino behind the camera saying it if you've got a version of the movie that's still got it in there, but I never noticed that. And I mm-hmm. thought it was amazing uh, that they kept yeah, it in there. Like, if your copy, if your copy doesn't have it, there are so like go online. There are so many videos like where they bring it up in the mix, and you can hear yeah. it clearly. I I never heard that before. I just thought it was interesting. Um, movie fun facts yep. with Dustin and Mally. I think Tim Roth is an stuck a- in the middle. <laughs> with you. I think Tim Roth is an acting. F- force in this movie man holy shit the oh god he dude for someone he, who's everyone fucking brings <laughs> for it. someone who's like he's much better in this than he was in funny games oh yeah for someone who's like basically stuck to the floor for the whole movie he quite is quite literally he is, i'm sure that blood had to dry at some point oh, they said they had to peel him off during takes like it was, oh really yeah they would take some time to, to peel him off but yeah because yeah, i've worked with a lot of dried blood before it is not fun when uh they first when mr white first kicks in the door and is dragging mr orange in and he's like crying saying she had a baby and like when he's just lying on the floor just bleeding out over time and when he's gotta tell marvin nash like marvin nash is like oh he cut off my ear and he's like fuck you i'm dying here like it's (laughs) so he's so fucking good that's one of my favorite interactions yeah i know because it's almost played for comedy because they cut back to Marvin Nash and he's like, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah, that's tr- that. Yeah, you are dying. That's true. But yeah. it Like you said, like, everybody brings it. This is like lightning in a bottle. Like you could not ask for a better script and better cast and a better like everything just clicked in this movie. It's just so it's just, I feel like it's just impressive because like the odds were stacked against him. But like everything, Dude, like, just I came agree. Together. Cause like that scene where they have Keanu buried in the backyard, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just like just his head sticking up. God, he just kills it. Yeah, I do feel bad for Mr. Orange though. Um, do you think our audience gets sick of all the knock knock jokes? I know I do. <laughs> um, I I just feel bad for Mr. Orange though, cause he's like a he's just fuck you. He's just like a baby in a mother's arms, and Mr. White, like Mr. White's like cradling him the whole movie, and it's it's I mean it doesn't make the ending any easier. Uh, no. But see what I do is I like I I stop the movie like just before the ending. The end. <laughs> so so everything uh, works out. In my head, they're like, ha, "JK guys, let's go get coffee." Um, y'all want to go see Expendables? <laughs> How do you feel about uh, Mr. Blonde being the only character that doesn't have a traditional color for a name? Like, you don't consider Blonde a yeah, typical color right? i mean it just i think i wonder if, i got wonder what the decision behind that was 
I'm sure Tarantino's got a good ca- a good reason for it, but I I mean Mr. Yellow doesn't sound nearly as cool. No, Mr. Blonde sounds like a great name, but it's also like it's interesting because he's clearly the most chaotic the- and crazy <laughs> out of all of them, and he's the only one that doesn't have a traditional color name. So it's almost kind of like like you giving also you a heads don't up. see him actually kill anyone. I know, for all well, you see him almost, which is <laughs> funny for the being the most violent person yeah there's not many deaths you do see on screen like most of it's implied like you see uh mr white kill two cops you see mr orange shoot a woman who's presumably dead and you see a uh, nice guy eddie shoot uh marvin nash but other than that i don't think you see anybody else get killed well i guess you, you can count tarantino getting shot in the head which mm. which is interesting he's still able to drive that car after that <laughs> not well but um Maybe you disagree with this, but I feel like there is um, a lot of restraint on Tarantino's part in this movie as a new director. Because this movie, when you look at all his other films, is maybe besides Jackie Brown, feels very uh, restrained. It could be the DP with the long takes um, or the editor really dictating how long to hold on those certain shots. But like, it just feels like a well-oiled machine. Like when they cut... Instead of, you know, sh- like Tarantino in later movies would have shown that ear being cut off for sure. Um, yeah. And he would do it all up close. It would be very dramatic and blood squirting out. But in this one to like just decide to pan up in a way like it could have been the DP suggestion. Um, I know they, they said they filmed it uh, with the, uh, the blood squirting out up close and everything. Could have been the editor's choice to do that. But I feel like there's so much more restraint here than you see later on in his... Uh, his later work. Yeah, I'll give you that one. Okay. <laughs> um, speaking of that, that uh, paint up in a way shot, I feel like there's so many iconic shots in this movie, like the dolly in on Mr. I mean, the f- the first instance of the something's in the trunk. Let's look into it. Oh, yeah. The, the start of the trunk, trunk shots. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like one of my favorite shots in the movie is that dolly in on Mr. Pink when he's shooting the cops and he's like, uh, resting his arm on the t- on the car rooftop and shooting, and of course, mm. like the standoff with Mr. Pink and Mr. White when he's on the floor pointing the gun up at him. That's I mean, it's on the poster, and then of course, like the close ups during the Mexican standoff at the end. Yeah, it, it, so many good shots, man. So many good shots. Um, God, that what a classic poster. Yeah, not a not classic. Not poster. my favorite of his posters, but I do like it. No, um, I think my favorites. Okay, it's got to be the Inglorious Bastard, just the helmet on the bat. See, I really like the other one of that, where it's the the knife going through the Nazi bandana. That one's pretty cool. Oh yeah. That but I think my favorite of his too. posters might be uh, the the Kill Bill Volume One, just the yellow with her holding the katana. I think it's a great poster. Yeah, that one's nice and simple. Um, I like the little details in this movie too. Like we mentioned about the foreshadowing of Mister Orange being the rat, but uh, mm-hmm. like, do you know about the soap bottles in the bathroom? Oh, the hints as to, like, who's still alive and whatnot? Yeah, because, like, the pink and white soap bottles are together, and those are the ones, Mr. Pink and Mr. White, in the bathroom. And then the orange one is, like, off to the side, laying on its side. Like, for Mr. Orange, who's li- mm-hmm. quite literally laying on his side. And then, apparently, the orange balloon during the uh, the scene where... See, now, I heard that's not actually... That was, like, just a happy accident. I know, I know. That's what I heard, too. Tarantino claims that's it was an crazy. accident. Crazy. I can't, I can't believe that, man. It's... If it was any other color balloon, you know, but how often do you see an orange balloon and one that would just every single day, one bro. that would just roll into frame that perfectly and the DPB are like, yeah, let's keep it in, you know, like it just seems way too coincidental, but yeah, I mean, they probably shot it and they were like, whoa, um, wow, that worked. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's your favorite trunk shot? I wanted to ask you that of his. Oh, out of fuck. Um, I think it's this one. This one's a classic, but I got to go with Bastards. It's not technically a trunk shot, but it's framed the same. Yeah, that's a pretty good one, too. The end of the movie when they're looking down after he carves the swastika. Yeah. (laughs) Um, He's like, I think this might be your best work yet. I miss Chris Penn, man. I love him in this movie. I love Nice Guy Eddie. <laughs> that tracksuit is so fucking iconic, and it's so it fits so well with his character. And I love that the only reason he's wearing that is because they couldn't afford to have him in a suit 
like they do uh, all the other ones. If this is for Cody. Yeah. <laughs> God, You're yes. You're a loose cannon. Oh, my God, yes. I forget all about that, but I do love I love that, too. <laughs> um, yeah, man. Uh, I miss I, I miss Chris forget, Penn. Um, dude, RIP. I always forget that he passed away. Yeah. Now I'm sad. And speaking of that, I uh-huh. things that I just forget. I always forget that Mr. Orange is the one who blows away Mr. Blonde. Because you forget he's there for, like, there's not only the torture scene, but there's a scene before it where they're all punching him and everything. And I, Nice Guy Eddie comes in. You forget Mr. Orange is there. <laughs> and then when, yeah. he, when he finally blows him away, I think that's just great storytelling, the fact that I'm not thinking about it. I'm like, Mr. Blonde's style, monologue is great. And then the torture scene is filmed so well that you don't even really see that much of it. It's That's good storytelling, man. I love it. Um. I agree. What do you think about the commode story? Wait, what? The bathroom story. The Sorry, I definitely fucking <laughs> spaced out again. Mr. Orange's story. The- I was reading about Chris Penn. <laughs> oh, no. Mr. Orange's story that he tells Joe to like convince him that he's uh, a shitty criminal like the rest of them. Like the commode story that he has to tell. Oh. I mean... He's doing his best to convince. Yeah, that he's not. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's it's clearly rehearsed, and it's. But yeah. I tell you what, one of my favorites, another one of my favorite shots in the movie is that three sixty camera, where he's like telling the story, but he's in the bathroom, and the cops are there, and he's kind of like breaking the fourth wall almost. I, uh, I feel like the director of the Guilty Conscious video ripped that idea off completely because they do that like 90 times Wait, in that the, music video. The Eminem song? Yes. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. Wow. But I, I love that shot. It's amazing, man. I love that song. Yeah. Um, This is something I never really got closure on, but what do you think about uh, the wedding ring. Eminem's beard. Yeah, I don't know. I'm really. Back uh, yeah, and forth I'm not. I'm not. I'm not here for the beard. Uh, what do you think? Anyway. What do you think about the wedding ring that Mr. Orange takes out of the jar of coins? Because they make a big deal out of it, but it's seemingly just for his for his backstory, right? I think so. But then he never mentions having a wife as his backstory, or you know, the way they play it, it's almost like he's wearing it because he actually has a wife. But that wouldn't make sense then, because then it would, you know, counter act with whatever he's told them as his backstory. But right, I don't know. I never really got closer on that. No one ever really gave me an huh. answer. That, yeah, I never really like they do kind of make a big deal out of it, but yeah, whatever. Uh, I've only got a few more notes here, Mally, but I did want to talk about the uh, the scene where they uh, pick their colors. Well, they they get their colors <laughs> told to them because I love how everything in this movie. It's, oh, Mr. Pink. It's played on such a childish level for such a serious, like, motive. Like, right? <laughs> they're they're seemingly getting arbitrary names picked for them for the this diamond heist that they're about to pull off. That's going to end up so violent and fucked up, but they have to stop and debate about the color names they're going to get picked. <laughs> like, it just <laughs> that's what makes this movie special. I think like everything is played like that. Like, the whole movie is like that. And I just, I don't know. I, Tarantino manages to do that with his dialogue somehow. I don't know how he does it. But, like, long stretches where nothing's happening but talking. Especially at the beginning between Mr. Pink and Mr. White. And nothing's really happened. They're just talking. But it's so fucking engaging. And it's just like, I don't know, man. It's that's what separates him, man, from the, the well, even the well-seasoned directors. This early on, it was clear this dude was a fucking genius. Um... What about the we should, we should talk about quotes too, right? Like this movie is like infinitely quotable. Like it's got some good ones. I I can't tell you how many times I say out of the fucking blue in my daily life. <laughs> like he's just going to decide. <laughs> yeah. I I can't I can't tell you how many times that comes. And then like oh, <laughs> did you shoot did you shoot anybody? Just some cops. Oh, so no real people. Like <laughs> And then, like, Mr. Pink having to convince everybody that he's a professional throughout the entire movie. <laughs> Man. <laughs> it's great. It's a great It's a great movie. I think that's what I'm getting at. I think my consensus is this is a great movie. Um, y- you think? I think the reason I love it, though, is because, like, this is like a student filmmaker or an amateur filmmaker's wet dream. Like, it's an amazing story. Uh, yeah. Again, that film school stigma. It's an amazing story shot on a low budget. 
with like like just the how they had to like piece the scene together like everybody bringing their own wardrobe spinning the entire music to budget on one song cho- choosing not to show the diamond heist and not show the torture and finding inventive and creative ways to get around that non-linear storytelling to introduce plot twists like it's it it this is essentially like peak amateur student filmmaking and unconventional and it just changed like everybody credits Pulp Fiction as changing how we tell stories, but man, I think Reservoir Dogs does it better. Did it sooner? And it's just I don't know. It's, it's such a much tighter script to me, tighter film. Um, the last thing I want to talk about before we get into the ending is actually related to the ending. Um, Ooh, segue. What do you think happened to Mister Pink? Arrested. Right. That's the consensus. Right? I mean, you can kind, of, yeah. I mean, you can kind of hear it. That's like if you, yeah. The the I, the thing is that, like, yeah, if you crank up the the mix, you can hear Mr. Pink outside being confronted by the cops, firing some shots, getting arrested, uh, with the diamonds, uh, in his hands. Yeah. Well, so, moral of the story is this bank heist was not a success. No. <laughs> but my question to you is. Mr. Pink says he stashes the diamonds away in a safe place. Presumably, that safe place is under the ramp because that's where he he walks out with the suitcase, does he not? In the ending? After everybody shot each other? Yeah, yeah. So how did he get that suitcase in there? Because he shows up second to the hideout and he doesn't have the suitcase with him. Maybe he got there before them. That's a good point. Stashed it, ran away, made it look like he hadn't been there yet. Good point. There's levels to the movie, Dustin. Yeah. Oh, another thing I wanted to ask you. This was uh, before you know we we all found out the answer, but the legend of this movie of who shot Nice Guy Eddie. Did you know about this? What there was before, like the commentaries came out for this movie, and like the uh, Tarantino kind of addressed what happened, but there was a legend. Uh, an urban legend about a magic bullet of who shot Nice Guy Eddie because... What is this? Fucking JFK? During, Jesus. During the Mexican standoff, uh, it's set up where, uh, you know, Nice Guy Eddie shoots Mr. White. Mr. White right. shoots Joe. But Nice Guy Eddie dies, and there was this con- like controversial kind of opinion that it was an off-screen shooter that mr pink shot him or that there was this. oh my god but th- there has been an answer and you can kind of see in the movie it's kind of hard to tell but mr white does shoot both of them and the only reason that happened it got played out like that is because nice guy eddie had a squib on that went off okay. prematurely and so harvey cocktail noticed it in the moment and had to kind of like turn and act like he shot him as well so the idea is that nice that Mr. White shoots both of them. But what I find interesting is like in the script, how did it go down where Nice Guy gets shot? Because essentially the Ooh. the Mexican standoff should have been exactly how it was supposed to play out. Joe gets shot and Mr. White gets shot, but it's never mentioned who would have shot Nice Guy Eddie then if Mr. White shot both of them or not. But huh. yeah, that was uh a big point of contention with a lot of people. But yeah, it turns out it was just a squib going off. If you watch the movie and kind of slow it down you can kind of see harvey Keitel noticing it turning and acting like he's shooting him as well and uh yeah so well, mr white you know what? while we're discussing this mm-hmm. i'm gonna see if i can pull it up okay um yeah that's all the notes i have is there anything that i forgot to cover that you wanted to talk about hang on sorry are you still looking it up I mean, in the script that I just pulled up online, mm-hmm. it straight up says that Mr. White shoots them all. Okay. That's fair enough, then. I don't think I've ever actually read the script to it. Uh, I just remember that being like a quote, like a, like a thing that was going around about this movie. It's who shot Nice Guy Eddie. Um, how great is his name, too? <laughs> um, is there anything else you wanted to talk about before? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get a cool nickname like that. Right? Yeah, if you type in who shot on Google, one of my first results is who shot Nice Guy Eddie. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Here's what that's. Here's that's what amazing. the uh, IMDb says. The bullets were supposed to plot to. F- can, wait, can my new nickname be Mean Guy Mally? Mean Guy. Mally. <laughs> uh, the way I'm seeing it on here is Joe shoots okay, Mr. Orange. No, it's fine. Just just avoid the question. <laughs> Joe shoots Mr. Orange. Eddie shoots Mr. White, and Mr. White shoots Joe, and then Eddie. 
And then, of course, uh, Chris Ben Squibb went off too early, and so he kind of fell to the floor anyway. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that solves that easy to solve mystery. Um, yep. I guess let's set up Technical the ending. Technical errors. Let's set up the ending for people. So uh, Joe comes in, announces to Mr. White, Nice Katie, and Mr. Pink that uh, Mr. Orange is a rat. Mr. Orange has shot Mr. Blonde to death after uh, he tried to torture Marvin, who Nice Katie mm-hmm. then shoots willy-nilly. I shot Marvin in the face. Yeah. <laughs> um, Just... All right, for any actors that get cast in a Tarantino film, if you get cast as someone named Marvin, you're going to die. Yeah, yeah. So Joe comes in and says, hey, this piece of shit on the floor, Mr. Orange, he's a rat. He's been working with LAPD. And Mr. White says, you're you're out of your mind. There's no way. You don't have any proof. Mr. Uh, well, Mr. Joe just says, you don't need proof when you got instinct, which, again, kind of speaks volumes for a political climate. But anyway, pulls a gun on oh, Mr. Orange. God. Mr. White then pulls a gun on Joe, and Nice Guy Eddie pulls a gun on Mr. White. So you've got this four-way Mexican standoff. Uh, there is that pointing that fucking gun at my dad. Uh, yeah, and then of course the classic line: "God damn you, Joe! God damn you!" Uh, mm-hmm. So Mr. White shoots. Well, Joe shoots Mr. Orange. Mr. White shoots Joe, and Nice Guy Eddie shoots Mr. White, and Mr. White shoots Nice Guy Eddie. So everyone, Joe, Nice Guy Eddie are dead. Mr. White is groveling in pain. Mr. Orange essentially, I would think doesn't even feel it because he's already bleeding out so much. Um, Mr. Pink emerges from underneath the ramp uh, during the gunfire with the suitcase in his hand, runs outside and presumably escapes. And if you have, if you don't crank up the mix in the background, you can't even really tell what happens. You just assume he escapes, which I thought for the Mm -hmm. longest time until I read up on the whole audio thing. Uh, Mr. White cradles Mr. Orange in his hands. Mr. Orange tells him, uh, I'm a cop. You can hear Mr. White kind of grovel in anger and pain that he just got shot for no reason defending this guy. Uh, Off screen, we hear the cops kick in the door, tell Mr. White to freeze. Uh, Mr. White then puts a gun to Mr. Orange's head. Off screen, we hear him pull the trigger, and we hear the cops pull the trigger on Mr. White, uh, presumably killing him. And uh, we hear the gunshots kind of ring out with some reverb. And then we cut to black. Cut to uh, put the lime in the coconut. <laughs> that's the end of the, the, in the, middle with you. And that's the, end of the movie. Uh, presumably everyone's either dead or arrested. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, is there anything else you want to talk about, Mally, before we get into Silver Linings? Um... No, not off the top of my head. Okay. Not off the top of my head. Uh, do you want to go first or do you want me to? Oh, no, no, no. Please, go ahead because I feel like you're going to step on my toes. So I fuck d- it. highly doubt it. Um, well, fuck Because I'm kind see. of... I've kind of got like a controversial one. Um, Interesting. Because I'm looking at this from... I don't know. You tell me if this doesn't count and I'll gladly step down from it. Um, okay. From what I always remember this movie when I first the first couple of times I saw it, not having, you know, a complete sound system and access to the stems of the mix, I always presumed Mr. Pink got away with the diamonds in his in the case. It wasn't until recently that I, you know, was reading up about the movie a couple of years ago and found out, oh, in the mix you can hear him having a shootout with the cops and presumably being arrested, but it's never confirmed. Um and I'm at the the line of thinking that if you don't see it on film and you don't hear it unless you, you know, had the stems to the fucking movie, that he gets away. Now, okay. my that's my silver lining that Mr. Pink at least gets away with the diamonds. However, I'm fully prepared to for that not to be an accepted I mean, answer. He doesn't I'm a, I'll give it to you cuz he doesn't die, he doesn't die. Like he just gets arrested. Yeah. Well, what is your silver lining? Because right. I got something else to kind of... Because I feel like my, the audience might not mine's be... Mine's a little loose. Okay. Mine's a little loose. Um, So even though it all goes to shit in the end and it's all built on a lie, orange and white just... They really just have that great friendship throughout the movie. Like that caring <laughs> like father-son relationship. It's so heartwarming. 
until it's not anymore. But like just those little moments with the, like Mr. White cares so much. Yeah. For Mr. Orange. Well, there's um. And it's all built on a lie, and you know he does shoot him in the head at the end. But like, well, uh, speaking about him shooting him in the head before that, yeah. There's um, Tarantino's, you know, has been asked, why would Mister Orange tell him that? He knows if he knows the cops are coming, like, because he has so much respect. Exactly. For him. I was gonna say, there's apparently Tarantino says there's a term in Japanese that doesn't necessarily translate that well into English, but when you betray someone and you have the opportunity to uh, set the record straight. That you kind of put it up to their hands what your punishment should be. That it's out of respect and being, you know, just a good person. And that's what Mr. Orange does rather than being like, oh, I'll just wait 60 more seconds. And, you know, because Mr. Orange does, like you mentioned, Mr. Orange does have that kind of almost like motherly, fatherly quality uh, that he sees in Mr. White to him. Like he kind of takes care of him the whole movie. And it's a beautiful thing. And if we, if the audience doesn't accept either of those answers, my other silver lining that is in, oh indisputable is that all these fucking criminals are either dead or arrested, <laughs> and that's good for uh, for everyone. Okay. So there you go. You can mold Boom. all that together into a silver Served. lining. <laughs> uh, Mally. Yes, me. Pick me up movie alternatives. Oh, I got I got a great one. Okay. Fantastic one. Lay, lay out the connection um, there. Um, Steve Buscemi. Mm-hmm. Mr. Pink to Donnie. The Big Lebowski. Okay. Okay. Uh, I actually... I, I, I got one written down here, but I'm not going to pick it because that just reminded me. Have you heard... Wait, wait. No, go, go, ahead, and, go ahead and throw it out there real okay, quick. Okay, the one I was going to say because I wanted to stay in the Tarantino universe was Django Unchained because it's one of his more uplifting endings to a movie. Okay, I'll give you that. Um, but what were you gonna say now? So you, I forgot all about this until just now. Uh, there is a fan theory out there that I just absolutely adore. Uh, I don't. I think I know where you're going. That Mr. Pink does get away at the end of this movie with the diamonds, and he becomes Donnie from. No, that he takes that money that he made from the diamonds and goes where? Las Vegas, and. What movie do we start off with seeing Armageddon? Seeing Steve Buscemi at the gambling table. Oh my god, yes, I'm fucking in Armageddon. Holy shit. <laughs> so yeah. Well, see, you know there's another theory that Con Air like Garland Green from Con Air ends the movie in Vegas and then yes. where do you find him at the beginning of Ar- like Yeah. Yeah. There's it I feel like there's like a Steve Buscemi like <laughs> there's a hidden movie cinematic there. universe you know what? that that exists that none of us know I about. I kind of want to write this movie now like what happens to Steve Buscemi like I'm implying that he's he's the same character in all these movies and like I want to write in the gaps there that can connect them all. Like he's just, like he's like like almost like how people have the theories about Stan Lee's cameos yes. in all the Marvel films. Yeah. It's the same thing with Steve I kind of want to write that movie down like just the the grindhouse b cult level movie of just connecting all these dots like um my buddy my buddy hauser uh has this idea for a movie that's amazing it's just like the the name of the movie is ryan gosling wants to kill john and it's just this idea that (laughs) ryan gosling really (laughs) hates my buddy but they're they're playing themselves for no reason and he just wants to write this movie about the whole time ryan gosling's trying to murder him (laughs) That's the kind of movie I want to make with the Steve Buscemi character. I think that'd be amazing. I'm I fucking love it. Also, um, shout out your buddy <laughs> Hauser for having one of the funniest fucking twitters on the face of the planet. Yes, yeah, everybody. That man follow him. tweets comedy gold. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that is one of my favorite films of all time, Reservoir Dogs. Mally, we have now covered two of my favorite films. Uh. My top five favorite films. This and Knock Knock? Yep. Uh, Wait, no, but what is the other buried, one, actually? Buried. Oh, that's right. Uh, that's right. Another one of my top five movies might be a potential episode here that we can discuss. But, uh, Mally, I wanted to discuss this with you on on the air to get your reaction. Oh, but God. So we got our season. You know I hate surprises. <laughs> we got our season two finale coming up in about... Uh, seven or eight episodes we're like two-thirds of the way through the season fuck and uh we haven't come to a consensus yet on what our season two finale is going to be last year we we have not we picked a pretty big bold movie with scarface yeah uh 
This year, I want to pose a suggestion to you and see what you think about this. Um, oh, dear. We can obviously, you know, ditch this idea if you don't like it and come up with one on our own. But I kind of think okay. we should let the audience decide. So, uh, for our listeners, they might not know this, but we have a list of uh, potential episodes for for uh, uh, potential movies for episodes that we kind of just pick and choose from willy nilly. Like, what do we want to talk about this week? And we pick them. See, you keep talking about this list. Never seen it. <laughs> um, I say you pick two or three movies from that list that you think would be great season two finale episodes. I'll pick two or three from the list and we make a poll on, uh, on Facebook or something. And we let the audience decide which of those movies they want to hear. Okay. Are you opposed to that? Do you think that's a good idea? All right. Because we yeah, got some I'm heavy down. hitters on there. Don't I have all three of mine picked. Already. I have all three of mine picked actually too. It's knock 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 and <laughs> knock knock. <laughs> I have all three of mine picked already. Um, okay. We, we will kind of show all our right. show our hands at uh, future episodes. We'll cover on the show, but I think it'd also be great for some fan interaction. Let the odd let the fans pick uh, what movie they want to hear us discuss, and of course I, we'll also okay. uh, you know retroactively and retrospectively kind of talk about this season as a whole when we do that episode but it's not for a few more weeks so we got plenty of time but we'll pick out like i said uh about six five or six episodes for people to pick from we'll announce uh what honestly hmm. i'm i'm not gonna lie you want to pick two or three go for it i have one movie that i'm putting out there oh. just one how about this because then? we'll uh i think it would be fucking epic to cover a very certain film okay We'll discuss this and off mic. Uh, which ones we're gonna pick? We will. And uh, this is gonna be interesting. I'll uh, we'll throw them up uh, two episodes before the finale. That way we can announce what they're gonna be, and then we'll find out what it's gonna be on our penultimate episode to let people know. All I'm gonna say is that my pick is controversial. I'm really just like trying to upset people. Okay. Well, you heard it here, people. Uh, speaking of upcoming episodes. Uh, next week, uh, you have a clue for us. What What do you got? I do. Um, w- all right, it's a two part clue. One is that I f- I think this film is very underrated. Mm. Um, mm. You shut your mouth. <laughs> shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. Okay. Shut your fucking. Mouth. Next week's gonna be an interesting episode. Um, the hint for next week is yep. there are no more white horses or pretty ladies at my door. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, tune in next week. Underrated. Tune, tune in next week to find out what that is. But uh, let's do some wrap-up here. If uh, if you're listening to us right now and you're not subscribed to us, please, please do so. Uh, you can leave us uh, a rating on iTunes or Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you listen to us. We're also on Google Play and YouTube. Um, thank you to those who have left us ratings and feedback already. We, you're not going ignored. We do read them. We do appreciate them. Uh, we're five stars on iTunes. So well, Dustin reads them. Yeah, I read them. Uh, <laughs> my I, ego I has skim to read it when them. Dustin sends uh, it to me. But yeah, thank you, thank you uh, to those who have done that. Thank you to the the contest winners too that have reached out to us and told us how much they appreciate the show uh, and enjoy us. Uh, speaking of contest code, you can. Uh, Enter a chance to win some more free stuff from us if you haven't already, like the past winners have. Reddit.com slash r slash silver linings playlist. Find the official discussion thread for uh for Reservoir Dogs. Leave that contest code we gave you earlier in the episode for a chance to win some free stuff. Uh or you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and hear about us on Twitter. Uh just search the Silver Linings playlist, you'll find us. Uh yeah, that's all I've got, man. Thank you for indulging me this week, Mally. I love Reservoir Dogs. You're welcome. Glad I finally sweetheart. got to talk about it uh, for over an hour. <laughs> and uh, you have you have, you were so like, dude, we're doing Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. Okay, Dustin. We got to start now. doing some shitty movies though, too, man. I feel like this season has been nothing but stacked episodes, other than like three or four. So uh, yeah. Clue, clue for next next episode after we do yours is we're going we're going back it's to shit be town. Something fucking ridiculous. We're going back to shit town because I got a lot to say about that movie when we get there. But uh, yeah, uh, until then and until next week, Mally, as always, stuck in the middle with you. I knew it was gonna be something different, so I didn't even bother trying. <laughs> I know it's I I have not said Excelsior in weeks weeks. weeks. 
But I will say it. Anyway, as always, Excelsior. Excelsior. Ah, there we go.